New York, this is Democracy Now! As you know, uh, you go to war with the army you have, uh, not the army you might want or wish to have. Donald Rumsfeld, considered the chief architect of the Iraq War, has died at the age of 88. The defense secretary for both Presidents George W. Bush and Gerald Ford, his critics say he presided over systemic torture, massacres of civilians, and illegal wars. Donald Rumsfeld was the most influential defense secretary we've had in the last half century. He left a powerful legacy. Unfortunately, almost his entire legacy was negative. We'll look at Rumsfeld's legacy with retired Colonel Andrew Bacevich, whose son was killed in Iraq. Bacevich is the president of the anti-war think tank, the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, and author of the new book, After the Apocalypse, America's Role in a World Transformed. We'll also speak with him about the U.S. airstrikes in Syria and Iraq targeting an Iranian-backed militia and the imminent pullout of almost all U.S. troops from Afghanistan, then to Ethiopia, where a ceasefire has been declared amidst the worst famine in a decade. The consequences and impact of the immediate ceasefire uh, remain unclear. Our humanitarian colleagues tell us there's been a breakdown in telecommunications and internet services in Tigray as of today. So the impact of the current situation on the humanitarian operations remain unknown at this moment. We'll speak with an Ethiopian scholar and with the chief of nutrition at UNICEF Ethiopia. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The chief financial officer of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, surrendered to authorities early this morning. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office is expected to file charges today against him and the Trump Organization, after indictments by a grand jury. Weisselberg has worked for Donald Trump and his family for nearly half a century. The Wall Street Journal reports the charges are related to the evading of taxes on fringe benefits, such as cars, apartments and private school tuition. Many legal experts are speculating prosecutors targeted Weisselberg with the hope he'll flip and help investigators in other ongoing probes into the former president's company. Bill Cosby was released from prison Wednesday after the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned his conviction for drugging and sexually assaulting Andrea Constant, a sports administrator at Temple University. She was one of 60 women who've accused Cosby of sexual assault dating back decades. In 2018, Cosby was sentenced to three to ten years in prison, becoming the first prominent man to be jailed after the start of the Me Too movement. The court ruled prosecutors had violated Cosby's rights by reneging on an unwritten non-prosecution agreement he had with a previous prosecutor. Attorney Gloria Allred, who represents 33 women who accused Cosby of assault, criticized the court's ruling. And even though the court did overturn the conviction, it was on technical grounds, it did not vindicate Bill Cosby's conduct. And it should not be interpreted as a statement or a finding that he did not engage in the acts of which he has been accused. Authorities in the Pacific Northwest fear hundreds of people have died from this week's unprecedented heat wave. British Columbia has now reported about 300 more deaths than normal during the heat wave, which was fueled by the climate crisis. In Oregon, officials say at least 63 people have died from the heat. Dozens are also also dead in Washington state. Meanwhile, residents in the Canadian village of Lytton in British Columbia have been forced to evacuate after a massive fire swept through the town, where the temperature recently soared to 121 degrees Fahrenheit. Lytton broke Canada's all-time heat record on three consecutive days this week. The mayor of Lytton told the CBC the whole town is on fire. 
Indigenous leaders and climate justice activists blockaded access to the White House Wednesday, calling on President Biden to invest more in climate justice initiatives in his infrastructure plans and to stop fossil fuel projects, including Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline and the Mountain Valley pipeline. This is Indigenous water protector Taisha Martineau, who is a member of the Fond du Lac tribe. When the PUC approved the Line 3 pipeline, they declared war on the Anishinaabe. And as Anishinaabe, I have been here for thousands of years. If we do not stop Line 3, none of us will be here long. Greenpeace has tricked a lobbyist at ExxonMobil into sharing secrets about the oil company's efforts to fight climate initiatives in Washington. The lobbyist, Keith McCoy, spoke candidly about his work, thinking he was speaking to a corporate headhunter. Did we aggressively fight against um, uh, some of the science? Uh, yes. Uh, did we hide? Our science, absolutely not. Uh, did we uh, did we join some of these shadow groups uh, to work against uh, some of the early efforts? Yes, that's true. Uh, but there's nothing there's nothing illegal about that. We were looking out for our investments. We were looking out for our shareholders. Exxon lobbyist Keith McCoy went on to tell Greenpeace that Exxon's support for a carbon tax is a public relations ploy because such a tax will never be implemented. He also identified 11 U.S. senators seen as crucial to Exxon's lobbying efforts, including Democratic Senator Joe Manchin. Joe Manchin, I talk to his office every week, and he is the kingmaker uh, on this because he's a Democrat from West Virginia, which is a very conservative state, and, and he's not shy about sort of staking his claim early yeah. and completely changing the debate. The death toll from last week's condominium collapse in Surfside, Florida, has reached 18, with another 145 people still missing. On Wednesday, rescuers found the bodies of 10-year-old Lucia Gada and her 4-year-old sister, Emma. Their parents also died when the Champlain Towers South Building collapsed. President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden are visiting the site today. COVID cases are surging in many parts of the world as the highly contagious Delta variant continues to spread. Russia's recorded over 650 new COVID deaths, its highest one-day tally. Bangladesh has deployed troops to enforce a new lockdown as deaths soar. Israel reported 300 new COVID cases Wednesday, its highest daily number of new infections in over three months. Cases are also rising again in Europe after a 10-week decline. Meanwhile, in Brazil, Protesters rallied in Brasilia, calling for the impeachment of Jair Bolsonaro over his mishandling of the pandemic. Brazilian lawmaker Perpetua Almeida took part in the protest. 500,000 deaths, the solidarity. The morning has made several political forces come together for a common goal, to stop the Bolsonaro government from killing. Lives could have been saved, lives could have been spared. The parliamentary investigation exactly shown that if the vaccine had been bought, more than 200,000 Brazilians could have been saved. Former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has died at the age of 88. Serving under George W. Bush, Rumsfeld oversaw the illegal U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq. He also authorized the systematic torture of men held in Afghanistan, Iraq and Guantanamo. Human rights attorneys repeatedly tried to hold him accountable by filing war crimes charges against him overseas. This is the late Michael Ratner of the Center for Constitutional Rights, speaking in 2006 at the height of the Iraq War. One of our hopes is really, we believe, and we have believed for 30 years, that torturers deserve no safe haven. They should not be free to travel around the world and go wherever they want uh, once, uh, once they've been seriously accused of torture. And they can be tried in those countries. And one of our goals here is to really turn, uh, I would hope, a Donald Rumsfeld into a Henry Kissinger, uh, where he will be not free uh, to travel from country to country. We'll have more on the death of Donald Rumsfeld after headlines with retired Colonel Andrew Basevich, who lost his son in Iraq.
The House of Representatives has voted to establish a select committee to investigate the January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol. Just two Republicans joined Democrats, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. For months, over other Republicans have downplayed the attack, which was time to disrupt the counting of electoral votes. On Wednesday, federal authorities announced or unsealed charges against 13 more people connected to the insurrection, including individuals with ties to the Oath Keepers, Proud Boys, the Boogaloo Boys and other far-right groups. Republican South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem has announced she's deploying 50 members of the South Dakota National Guard to the U.S.-Mexico border at the request of Texas Governor Greg Abbott. But there's a twist. The deployment is being paid for by billionaire Republican megadonor Willis Johnson, who lives in Tennessee. Some critics have accused Nome of turning the National Guard into a private mercenary force targeting migrants. In tech news, Amazon is seeking to force the new chair of the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan, to recuse herself from antitrust investigations into the company due to her past writings about Amazon. As a student at Yale Law School, Khan wrote a widely read paper detailing how antitrust laws had failed to prevent Amazon from growing into a monopoly. Chinese President Xi Jinping spoke before 70,000 people in Tiananmen Square today to mark 100 years since the founding of the Chinese Communist Party. During his speech, she pledged to reunify Taiwan with China and warned against, quote, bullying by other countries. The Chinese people have never bullied, oppressed or subjugated the people of other countries. We haven't done that in the past. We are not doing it now, and we won't do it in the future. At the same time, the Chinese people will never allow any foreign force to bully, oppress or subjugate us. Anyone who dares to try to do that will have their heads battered in front of the Great Wall of Steel, forged with the flesh and blood of over 1.4 billion Chinese people. In related news, the Financial Times reports the U.S. and Japan have been secretly conducting war games and joint military exercises in the South China Sea to prepare for a possible conflict with China over Taiwan. Some of the joint military exercises were disguised to look like disaster relief training. In other international news, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres has urged the Biden administration to lift sanctions on Iran and for both countries to return to the 2015 nuclear deal. Meanwhile, outgoing Iranian President Hassan Rouhani has accused Biden of continuing Trump's economic war against Iran. Rouhani described the U.S. policy as a form of economic terrorism. In Canada, another 182 unmarked graves have been found at a former boarding school for First Nations children in British Columbia. It's the third major discovery in recent weeks of graves at residential schools where Indigenous children were forcibly sent to rid them of their native cultures and languages. Meanwhile, Pope Francis has finally agreed to meet with Indigenous survivors of Catholic-run residential schools in Canada. The Pope has faced widespread criticism for refusing to apologize for the Church's role in what Canada's National Truth and Reconciliation Commission described as cultural genocide. The Israeli newspaper Ynet is reporting the Palestinian Authority is attempting to buy tear gas canisters, stun grenades and other non-lethal munitions from Israel. The unusual request came as the Palestinian Authority is cracking down on protests and dissent in the occupied West Bank following the death of human rights activist Nazar Banat in Palestinian Authority custody. On the last day of Pride Month, the U.S. State Department announced it's working towards allowing gender nonconforming applicants to use the gender-neutral X marker on their passports. The State Department's also dropping a rule requiring trans applicants provide medical certification in order to change the gender marker on their passports.
The New York City Board of Elections has released new preliminary results from the city's Democratic mayoral primary, one day after accidentally releasing a tally that included 135,000 test ballots. The new numbers show frontrunner Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams leading former Sanitation Commissioner Catherine Garcia by about two percentage points. Civil rights lawyer Maya Wiley placed third, just 347 votes behind Garcia. The city still has to count 124,000 absentee votes in the election, the city's first using ranked choice voting. And the Board of Trustees at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill has voted to grant tenure to incoming journalism professor Nicole Hannah Jones, ending a bitter weeks long dispute. The Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist is best known for her work at The New York Times, where she produced the 1619 Project, an interactive project that re-examines the legacy of slavery. The university initially denied her tenure after a prominent donor raised issues about her work on the 1619 Project. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. When we come back, Donald Rumsfeld, considered the chief architect of the Iraq War, has died at the age of 88. The defense secretary for both presidents, George W. Bush and Gerald Ford, his critics say he presided over systemic torture, massacres and illegal wars. We'll look at Rumsfeld's legacy with retired Colonel Andrew Basevich, whose son was killed in Iraq. He's president of the anti-war think tank, the Quincy Institute. Stay with us. Now, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Donald Rumsfeld, chief architect of the Iraq War, died Wednesday at the age of 88. Rumsfeld served under four presidents and was secretary of defense under both presidents George W. Bush and Gerald Ford. His critics say he presided over systemic torture, massacres of civilians and illegal wars. As defense secretary, Rumsfeld was quick to advise President Bush to target Iraq after the 9-11 terror attacks, even though al-Qaeda had been sheltered by the Taliban in Afghanistan and Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with the attack. This is Rumsfeld speaking at a press briefing in 2002 about whether Iraq gave weapons of mass destruction to terrorists. The message is that there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. So when we do the best we can and we pull all this information together and, and we then say, well, that's basically what we see as the situation. That is really only the known knowns and the known unknowns. That was Donald Rumsfeld in 2002. As the war in Iraq dragged on, he faced intense questioning from troops. In 2004, a soldier asked Rumsfeld why vehicle armor was still in short supply three years in. This was his response. As you know, uh, you go to war with the army you have, and not the army you might want or wish to have. Many critics, including human rights groups and a bipartisan Senate committee, have said Rumsfeld should have faced criminal charges for decisions that led to the abuse of detainees at the Abu Ghraib prison near Baghdad and at the Guantanamo Bay detention camp. 
Jamil Jaffer, director of the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University and former ACLU deputy director, tweeted, quote, Rumsfeld gave the orders that resulted in the abuse and torture of hundreds of prisoners in U.S. custody in Afghanistan, Iraq and Guantanamo Bay. This should be at the top of every obituary. More than 100 prisoners died in the course of interrogations. Investigations were haphazard at best, but the military itself concluded that some of the prisoners were tortured to death. For more, we're joined by Andrew Basevich, president and co-founder of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He's a retired colonel and Vietnam War veteran. Basevich is professor emeritus of international relations and history at Boston University and author of several books. His most recent book, Just Out, is titled After the Apocalypse, America's Role in a World Transformed. In May, he wrote a piece for The Boston Globe, headlined, My Son Was Killed in Iraq 14 Years Ago. Who's Responsible? We welcome you back to Democracy Now!, Professor Basevich. Um, why don't you start off by talking about the legacy of Donald Rumsfeld? Well, the newspapers are referring to him as the most uh, influential defense secretary since Robert McNamara back in the uh, 1960s. I think that's appropriate, accurate. He was like McNamara uh, in a specific sense, I think, that he brought to office, Rumsfeld brought to office, uh, certain convictions about how the Pentagon needed to change. Uh, and from day one, he set out to implement that vision. What Rumsfeld didn't anticipate uh, was 9-11 and its aftermath. Uh, specifically the Iraq War. Uh, and you're right, I think, to describe him as the principal architect of that war. He attempted to fight it consistent with his reform vision. That is to say, the expectation that, that superior American technology would bring about a quick and decisive victory. He got that wrong. He got that wrong because of his misunderstanding of war and his inability to appreciate the historical, cultural, sociological, religious uh, elements of war. And therefore, what was supposed to be a quick and decisive victory ended up being a protracted, ugly disaster. And that's why Iraq needs to be, you know, the most important item inscribed on his his headstone. He was a disaster. Now, Andrew Basevich, as you've said, uh, he was considered the most powerful defense secretary since McNamara. But even once it became clear that the Iraq war was waged under false pretenses, in other words, there were no weapons of, of mass destruction, unlike McNamara, who issued an apology in the documentary uh, Fog of War, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, on the contrary, uh, was the least uh, apologetic and affirmed uh, the fact that the U.S. should have uh, uh, gone into Iraq and that any premature withdrawal uh, would be a mistake. Well, I, you know, I can't pretend to, you know, peer into his soul. Uh, he clearly was a stubborn man, a proud man, uh, and I think, uh, you know, unwilling uh, to confront his own failings, which became manifest. Uh, when we come to 2006, uh, the end of 2006, when uh, President George W. Bush decided to fire him, uh, his failure by then had become evident to just about everybody other than Rumsfeld or perhaps uh, his, his, uh, his friend, Vice President Cheney. Uh, you know, there are many, many historical figures with the passage of time find their, their reputations uh, revised, perhaps improved, perhaps, uh, you know, uh, subjected to greater criticism. I don't expect that there's going to be any revision of Donald Rumsfeld's uh, reputation in the future. He was a catastrophically bad and failed defense secretary who radically uh, misinterpreted the necessary response to 9-11 and therefore caused, uh, you know, almost immeasurable damage to our country, uh, to Iraq, uh, to, to the Persian Gulf more broadly. Uh, 
And I don't think there's any way to disguise that. I wanted to go to that first clip that we played, uh, which is, um, you go to <clears throat> war with the army you have. If you could comment on that, um, and also the fact that you, like so many in the United States and in Iraq, lost a loved one in Iraq, and what that means, what role Donald Rumsfeld played in that, but not just Rumsfeld. If you could talk with this focus on Rumsfeld about the responsibility of the man he worked for, President George W. Bush. Well, I, uh, um, I, I tend to, to want to resist judgments about responsibility that I think can be too simple. And, and therefore let others off the hook. So if somebody asks me straight out, do I feel that, do I think Donald Rumsfeld is responsible for the death of my son? I would say no. Do I think George W. Bush is responsible? No, at least not, not specifically. Where does responsibility lie? Well, I've come to believe that, that there is a collective responsibility, uh, that, that we the people, not we the people, every one of us, but, but we the pe people are implicated in the Iraq war. You know, we the people embraced a conception of America's role in the world that really amounted to support for <clears throat> militarized global hegemony. And that in response to 9-11, we collectively concurred with the uh, tragically misguided response of the George W. Bush administration that said we should embark upon a global war on terrorism. That was a strategic mistake. It was a moral mistake. Uh, but it's one that the majority of the American people, shocked by the events of 9-11, signed up to. So I don't think there really is an easy answer when we, when we look to something like the Iraq war and we want to finger a particular individual for responsibility or guilt. I, I think that responsibility for these uh, mistakes, huge mistakes, uh, tends to be rather widely shared. And we, ought, we need to always circle back to, uh, to uh, the realization that we are a democracy. Uh, and, and, and these people in Washington who are making decisions on our behalf, even when they are radically ill-advised decisions, to some degree, are doing so with our collective concurrence. And I, I would say that in particular with regard to the Bush administration in Iraq, when you realize <clears throat> that in 2004, uh, we uh, re-elected George W. Bush to a second term. And in doing that, of course, agreed to have Donald Rumsfeld continue uh, for a couple more years as defense secretary. So I think that it's important to, uh, to avoid the simple judgments of pointing to a particular individual to say, guilt lies there. That's, that's too easy. Well, Andrew Bacevich, I mean, you, you've just said that, uh, and that's a crucial point, that Bush was re-elected uh, uh, despite all the manifest failures of his administration. Uh, one of the most staggering, of course, was the invasion of Iraq, uh, <clears throat> which, as you say, it's Rumsfeld alone is not to uh, be held responsible, but it's a far greater uh, <clears throat> responsibility, especially since, of course, he was uh, appointed by an administration that was re-elected. And now, uh, to turn to present wars and the, the legacy of that uh, uh, initial decision, Biden has now become the sixth consecutive president in the U.S. to bomb uh, Iraq. So could you talk about that and the enduring legacy of uh, uh, Rumsfeld's uh, uh, position as, as defense secretary and also the continuities that you see in uh, Biden's uh, Middle East policy? Well, I think you're right in, in reminding us that, he's, that uh, Biden is the sixth consecutive president to use violence against Iraq. In other words, going all the way back to George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, six presidents, uh, both Republicans and Democrats. It's not as if that one party or the other uh, owns 
the the forever wars, as we have chosen to uh, to call uh, to call them. Uh, I think what we see in this, you know, militarily, the uh, the the most recent airstrike ordered by President Biden is a trivial event. Uh, it, it, but it reminds us that the forever wars continue. Uh, Biden's decision, which I fully support, uh, to withdraw U.S. military forces from Afghanistan, our longest war ever, led some observers to say, well, I guess the forever wars are coming to an end. We're ringing down the curtain. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, this administration's uh, military inclinations are not terribly different from the, the, the previous five administrations that bombed Iraq. Uh, this administration shows no inclination uh, to back away from the notion that the United States must remain militarily preeminent in the world. This, this administration shows no signs of backing away from the inclination to use force, which really is one of the central themes of US policy since the end of the Cold War. During the Cold War, there was some reluctance to use force because of concerns that we'd start World War III. Since the end of the Cold War, uh, starting with George Herbert Walker Bush, there's been this promiscuous tendency uh, to, to use force. And I think when we examine the record of American wars over now the past, what, 30, over 30 years, it's hard to see that the country has benefited in any serious way. It's relatively easy to tote up the costs that we have paid and, of course, the costs inflicted on others, like the people of Iraq and the people of Afghanistan. Um, I have to say that from my own point of view, uh, there is a, 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 an enormous need uh, for serious reflection. The, the 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 Democrats want to see us create some kind of a commission to investigate the events of January 6th, the uh, assault on on the on the Capitol. I fully support that, but I think there is a far greater need uh, to evaluate the the origins and the conduct of our, our post 9/11 wars, which, as I say, have done such enormous damage. Sadly, and this is one of the things I talk a little bit about in my in my book. Sadly, I think that the, the inclination to, to move on and to forget uh, is, is very much in evidence in our politics today. So, well, Andrew, I'm let's talk. There's a two, part, two parts uh, uh, question that, that I'd like to ask you about what you call the promiscuous tendency uh, on the part of you, the U.S. to use force. Democratic critics in Congress have warned that these recent repeated retaliatory uh, attacks against Iranian proxies uh, in the Middle East should come under the War Powers Act. So your response to that, could you explain what the War Powers Act is and what the impact of that would be? And then <clears throat> second, uh, the earlier this week, the House voted massively in favor of repealing two separate authorizations of military force, uh, the 1991 Gulf War, AUMF, and a little known uh, 1957 AUMF uh, passed during the Cold War. But the broader uh, authorization for the use of military force, the one that's been most frequently invoked is the one passed following 9-11. What prospect do you see uh, for that being repealed, and, and what would that mean? As far as I can tell, virtually no prospects uh, whatsoever, which, which I would say is another demonstration of the, frankly, the moral cowardice uh, of the Congress, the unwillingness of the Congress as a body to take responsibility, uh, to, to live up to its constitutional duties, the duty to declare war. Uh, we have fallen into the habit, really dating probably from uh, the time of the Korean War, uh, we, we, we have fallen into the habit of deferring to the president as commander in chief to pretty much decide when and where the nation is going to going to fight. And the, the fact that this blanket authorization uh, passed in the immediate aftermath of 9/11, continues in, in force today, and, and is, is used by by a, by a succession of presidents to attack whoever they want to attack. I think is is a, a good example of how the Congress has uh, 
has failed us, has has failed the nation. You act. You asked about the War Powers Act. So this is a piece of legislation passed uh, right at the end of the Vietnam War, when, when there was a serious interest within the Congress to try to reclaim uh, a role in deciding when and where a force was going to be uh, used. Uh, but it's been a dead letter. No president, no president has been willing to acknowledge that the War Powers Act is a legitimate uh, a source of restraint on, on presidential uh, authority. So it's a nice piece of paper, uh, but it's one that gets roundly ignored. And the fact of the matter is that, that presidents have come to expect that they can uh, do what they want to when it comes to dropping bombs or attacking people. President Biden has now demonstrated to, that he too uh, buys, into that, buys into that claim. Uh, it's a big problem. Can you talk about the constant targeting of Iran as a justification for everything that has happened? You yourself received a letter you wrote about in the Boston Globe from a law firm to join a class action suit on the loss of your son because Iran was responsible for the Iraq war, going right to this latest attack on Syria and Iraq by the Biden administration, the second time it did this, uh, citing Iranian-backed militias, at the same time that um, it, the U.S. is supposedly attempting to to rejoin uh, the U.S. nuclear pact that Trump pulled out of? Well, the demonization of Iran is now a well-established uh, sort of reality of our contemporary politics. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a mistake. Uh, you know, we, we, have a, we have a narrative that describes U.S.-Iranian relations uh, that dates back to uh, the the hostage crisis of the of the late 1970s. Uh, we our, our narrative doesn't include anything that happened before then. Our narrative does not include uh, the CIA's uh, overthrow of Iranian President Mossadegh back in the early 1950s. Uh, and so, over the past uh, 40 years or so, we've we've decided that Iran needs to be classified uh, as an evil power. Uh, and I think that that inclination uh, makes it very difficult for us to come to a, a reasoned understanding of, of, of how we got so deeply enmeshed in the Persian Gulf and, and, and how it is that we end up uh, basically in the pocket of the Saudis who do not share our values, who do not share our interests, and taking t taking their side in their competition with the Islamic Republic of Iran. I don't want to sound like I'm an Iranian apologist. Theirs is a, an oppressive government that denies uh, basic freedoms. I do think it would be reasonable for us to at least acknowledge that Iran ha has its own security interests. You know, th think, think about 9-11 and its aftermath. Uh, George W. Bush declares a global war on terrorism. He singles out what he calls the axis of evil, Iraq, Iran, North Korea, as the principal targets. We're going to war, and we're going to war against the axis of evil. Uh, George W. Bush uh, announces the Bush Doctrine, which grants us the right, the prerogative, to wage preventive war. In other words, we can go, we can, we claim the prerogative of waging war against whoever we want to. George W. Bush then implements that claim by invading Iraq in 2003. Well, what the heck would be the response of Iranian leaders to that set of circumstances? I think quite logically, they would say, wait a second, we're next on the hit list. If the Americans succeed in achieving their objectives in Iraq, then the Americans are going to come back after us. And therefore, the Iranian response, I think, was quite logical. That is to say, uh, 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 Iran did whatever it could to assist the Iraqi resistance to the U.S. occupation, which occurred, of course, as a result of initiating an illegal war. 
I'm not not defending the Iranian government, but I think that their behavior was uh, quite rational. One might even say justified. And until we as a nation, until our political leaders are willing to take on that perspective, I think it'll be very difficult for us to come to a more reasoned and balanced approach to U.S. policy in that part of the world. And quite frankly, something of the same logic applies to the way that people in Washington today are, are talking about the challenges posed by the People's Republic of China. Uh, I think a first principle of strategy needs to be to try to look at the situation from the perspective of the other side. Uh, only then is it possible to avoid the kind of errors that have plagued us uh, in our use of military power since 9-11. Well, Andrew, I'd like to ask about the uh, about Afghanistan, the, the U.S., the Biden administration making the decision to bring uh, the longest war in U.S. history to a close. Uh, U.S. troops, most U.S. troops uh, likely to withdraw uh, within days. Now, many people, uh, there was the intelligence assessment that, that was uh, just revealed uh, earlier this week that uh, Afghanistan could fall to the Taliban, the, the present regime, uh, the present administration of Ashraf Ghani uh, could fall within six months of the U.S. withdrawal, others warning of a possible civil war uh, with the U.S. withdrawal. Now, you've said, even as a staunch advocate of uh, uh, American withdrawal from Afghanistan, that uh, the U.S. withdrawal does not uh, absolve uh, uh, the U.S. of responsibility for what comes next. What do you see as that responsibility and what do you anticipate happening in Afghanistan? You know, I tell you, the uh, events seem to be moving so quickly there, it's hard to keep up with them. We had that uh, interview by uh, General uh, Scott Miller, the U.S. general commanding the remnant of, of U.S. forces uh, in Afghanistan that w was strikingly candid and I thought uh, pessimistic. Uh, so things could fall apart there <clears throat> more quickly than I think almost anyone realizes. We'll see. Nothing is guaranteed. But what's our responsibility? It's moral. Uh, it's humanitarian. Uh, first of all, we have a responsibility to Afghans who supported the U.S. effort over the past two decades. If they want to leave, we need to make it possible for them to leave. That means uh, uh, accelerating the approval the special visas for those individuals and their families to leave the country and come to the United States if they wish to do so. Uh, my general sense is that there's a recognition of the moral imperative of doing that, but not a heck of a lot of urgency. It's also possible that just as with what happened after the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan back in 1979, that there could be a major refugee problem that stems out of any return of the Taliban to power. Uh, we need to own that. We need to be acting now to try to prepare for providing assistance to refugees who leave Afghanistan and go to neighboring countries. But I think there are also, beyond, beyond the moral question, there is a strategic issue. And a strategic issue centers on, A, the realization that our military efforts along with our coalition partners, our efforts to create a legitimate government in Kabul, supported by effective security forces, that effort has definitively failed. And so what? Well, the so what is that there, there will be a, there will be other nations in the region that have a shared interest in preventing Afghanistan from descending into absolute chaos. You, you referenced the reports of Afghan militias uh, preparing themselves uh, to, for, for what will in effect be a civil war. We need to engage with neighboring countries that, have, that share our interest in preventing that chaos from occurring. No guarantee uh, that we can prevent that. Ultimately, Afghans are gonna decide the fate of Afghanistan. Uh, but neighbors can have some influence on the course of events. This is a time for creative and intensive diplomacy on our part.
As we wrap up, Professor Basevich, why did you title your book After the Apocalypse? Well, I wrote it. I wrote it last year, uh, and I wrote it last year when the, when the word apocalypse or apo uh, apocalyptic were becoming pretty commonplace in media reporting. What, what, what was this all about? Well, it was about. Uh, I, I noticed in, in your in your lead in, Amy, you referred to the climate crisis, and I realized I'm always referring to things like climate change. No, you're right. We're in the midst of a climate crisis. The climate crisis combined with the coronavirus crisis, combined with an economic crisis, combined with the crisis of the incompetent, uh, dishonest Trump presidency, combined with the crisis of wars we don't know how to sh shut down. So I was trying to write a book that was going to reflect on how th this collection, unprecedented collection of crises confronting the nation should lead us to rethink the role that we play in the world. And so that's, it's a short book, but that's basically what the book is about. Andrew Basevich, I want to thank you for being with us, President and co-founder of the anti-war think tank Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, retired colonel, Vietnam War veteran, professor emeritus of international relations and history at Boston University. His new book, After the Apocalypse, America's Role in a World Transformed. When we come back, we look at Ethiopia. Stay with us. Wisdom by Nasir Shama. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Earlier this week, the Ethiopian military withdrew its forces from Mahale, the capital of the war torn Tigray region, after the government declared a ceasefire. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed denied reports his military was defeated by Tigrayan forces and offered another reason for the retreat. When we entered Macau seven or eight months ago, it was because it was the center of gravity for the conflict. It was center of a government, a center for known and unknown resources. But by the time we exit, there's nothing special about it. The Ethiopian prime minister is a Nobel Peace Prize winner. He's come under fire for his response to the conflict that erupted in November when the Ethiopian government launched an offensive against Tigray separatists. Since then, thousands have been killed. Over a million civilians have been displaced. Some 350,000 people are now on the brink of famine. Abiy has denied there's hunger in Tigray, but the United Nations says it's the worst malnutrition crisis in a decade and it's projected to get worse without urgent aid and unhindered access to those in need. The UN says as multiple parties in the conflict may be guilty of violating international law, possibly amounting to war crimes and crimes against humanity, including indiscriminate killings and sexual violence, using rape as a weapon of war. Meanwhile, results are expected soon from last week's parliamentary and regional elections that will determine whether Abiy Ahmed will remain in power. For more, we joined by two guests. And Addis Ababa Stanley Chitekwe is with us, the chief of nutrition at UNICEF Ethiopia. In Washington, D.C., we're joined by Alamayo Fanto Willemariam constitutional law scholar, political theorist and conflict analyst, previously served as a national peace advisor to the Ministry of Federal Affairs, currently lectures at Mahala University's School of Law. 
Uh, he's also political commentator for Ethiopia Insight. And uh, we're going to turn to you first, Adamayo Fento, Wildemariam. Thanks so much for joining us. Can you talk about the significance of this ceasefire, why it happened, and um, all this in the context of the elections and the famine that uh, could engulf uh, this area of Tigray? Uh, thank you, Amy, for having me. Uh, I think uh, one thing that we need to be very clear about the unilateral truce is that there isn't such a thing as unilateral truce, especially in the in this context uh, in which uh, the, uh, the prime minister declared unilateral ceasefire. He was defeated in the past two weeks. Um, massive counteroffensive was happening. Uh, uh, was mounted against the Ethiopian National Defense Forces by the Tigrayan Defense Forces. Uh, they were able to route several divisions of the NDF. Uh, so it's after this defeat that uh, the federal government uh, said it has called for a unilateral truce. So as to its significance, the significance uh, is also something that the international community, as well as the people of Tigray, need to be vigilant about. Uh, because uh, even if what the, I mean, if the truth was honest, the Ethiopian government would, would also tell its allies, the Eritrean forces and the Amhara regional forces, to withdraw from territories, the grand territories that they have occupied since the start of the war in uh, November, uh, on November 4, uh, 2020. So this is, this is going to be a very, uh, a prelude to the ultimate sh showdown between Amhara and uh, Tigrayan forces on those western and uh, southern territories of Tigray. And that would be a very destructive. And Alma, you anticipated this conflict as early as 2018. Can you explain uh, why you thought this uh, uh, violence would, would break out? And also, if you could give some context as to the origins uh, of this war, uh, the historical origins of it. So Ethiopia has been tittering on the brink of civil war for quite some time since the coming to power of the new prime minister in April 2018. Uh, the prime minister uh, had this extraordinary talent for trickery and fraud. So one of the very first things he did in the very first uh, few months uh, after coming to power was um, in uh, 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 contravention of the constitution to give the marching order to the national defense forces to intervene in the Somali region of Ethiopia to remove its leader. So now that it has come a full circle, it started out in Somalia, in the Somali region of Ethiopia, by removing the leader. I mean, uh, the the regional leaders might be responsible for some heinous human rights violations, but the constitutional procedure for armed intervention in the internal affair of a region, uh, a region which is a member of the Federation, has not been followed. So uh, what he did also was he played the same, he played the same uh, political theatrics, legal and political theatrics, uh, uh, they put on a show of constitutional interpretation, uh, which uh, prohibited, uh, which postponed, in effect, postponed the national and regional elections and banned the Tigray region from explicitly uh, from holding its regional elections for its regional state council. Uh, knowing that the region would uh, really defy and go go ahead, then that's exactly what happened. I wanted to because, bring... Because, you know, you cannot tell... Yeah. I, 
I wanted to bring Stanley Chitekwe in from Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, the chief of nutrition, UNICEF Ethiopia. As we talk about the situation here, the ceasefire in the midst of the elections, you are dealing with, and the people of uh, the Tigray region, Ethiopians in the war-ravaged Tigray region, are facing the world's worst famine in a decade. Can you describe what's happening there and what has to happen, Stanley? Yes, thank you for having me. We are seeing very high levels of malnutrition among children under the age of five years of above 15 percent that is wasting, and this is considered to be very high. Malnutrition among pregnant and lactating women ranging from, ranges from 40 to 50 percent. Again, this is very high with potential long-term impact. And pre-crisis, pre the conflict, we realized also that uh, Tigray region had already a very high level of malnutrition, uh, stunting. Standard growth among under fives was already 10 percentage points above the national average. Wasting also was about two percentage points above the national average. And the latest study has shown that on food security, we have about 5.5 million people that are in, in a range which we call from IPC3, 4, and 5. So this is a very high proportion. And the report of looming famine comes from the fact that if certain risks are not removed, and there are mainly two risks that we are talking about, number one, continued conflict, uh, as well as number two, uh, limited access to provide humanitarian access, this malnutrition situation may deteriorate into famine. Stanley, what do you think urgently needs to be done? What are you calling on the international community to do uh, to alleviate uh, famine conditions in, in, in the region and also humanitarian access uh, uh, reaching the people who need it most? Yes, there are three elements that we know are very critical. Number one is to do with access. Uh, we know the conditions and situation are changing very rapidly. But as until now, we know that there were about 29 districts out of 93 that were hard to reach. And there were about 39 that were partially accessible. And out of the 93, we only had 21 districts that we had full access. So access is a very strong precondition. Number two, uh, we also realize that capacity is an issue. The extent of the challenge of malnutrition and food insecurity is so huge. There's need to ramp up support in terms of the capacity of the implementers, UN agencies, NGOs. We need more human resources, more materials to be able to respond, food and specialized foods that we use to treat uh, severely malnourished children. So we are talking about need for additional capacity and then resources. By resources, we are also talking about financial a number of sectors, be it nutrition, food security, water, we are ramping up our response in order to reach people as quickly as possible within the next uh, 30 to 60 days uh, to avert the looming famine. So there is need for uh, additional financial resources from our generous donors. Stanley Chitekwe, who is getting in the way of people getting access to so much needed aid? I think up until now, uh, there were three entities, and we, it's not always very clear which entity is making this. I think the main thing is that when there is conflict, when there is exchange of fire, it is not possible for humanitarian workers to find a, a safe corridor. So access is also an issue of perception in terms of where you see there's an exchange of fire. It is impossible for our humanitarian workers uh, to, to, to access those places. So ceasefire is a precondition for access. We want to thank you both for joining us. We'll continue to follow the situation on the ground. Stanley Chitekwe, Chief of Nutrition, UNICEF Ethiopia, speaking to us from the capital in Addis Ababa, and Alamayo Fento Wandomarian, constitutional law scholar, political theorist, and conflict analyst. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! is produced with Renee Fels, Mike Burke, 
Christina Gozder, Messiah Rhodes, Maria Tarasena, Carla Wills, Tommy Warrenoff, Trina Nadura, Sam Malkoff, Tamari Astudio, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood, Adriana Contreras. Our general manager is Julie Crosby. Special thanks to Becca Staley, Miriam Barnard, Paul Powell, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Hugh Grand, Dennis Moynihan, David Prude, and Dennis McCormick. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea. Thanks so much for joining us.